title of my lecture for today would be Federalism and the Institutional Design Literature, the Crucial Role of Political Science in Assessing the Duterte Administration's Constitutional Overall Project. But first, some, some acknowledgments. I would like to thank the Association of Political Science Organizations of the Philippines, Greater Local APSO, uh, for having me as their speaker for their first APSO annual uh, public lecture on political science. Special thanks to the APSO organizing team who spent an enormous amount of time and effort to make this first annual public lecture possible. Uh, Ms. Maina Dafanan, who unfortunately could not join us, I'm happy to know that Ms. Dana Victoria is here. I think she was supposed to be in a makeup class for Econ. Good that it did not proceed because I could see her. She was a former student of mine in a democratization class. That's Ms. Dana Victoria of UP Diliman. Third is, of course, our the one who introduced me. Okay, he asked Professor Torres to make sure that I don't see the introduction. So that's why I had nothing to do with that introduction. If I saw that introduction, I would have edited 90% of it. That's Mr. Uh, Aldin Marte de Leon of UB de Leon. Then Mr. Rob Buela, where is he? Okay, from UST. Mr. Keisha Barres. Okay, from University of the East, and last, Mr. Leo Aminola of UP Diliman. Special thanks also to Professor Torres Pilapil of UP Diliman uh, for her heroic efforts in helping out the APSOP organizing team. I hope what you have learned in your first APSOP okay, could be passed down to the next generation so that we could institutionalize this APSOP okay, public lecture. Uh, I would also like to thank everyone in the audience today, but special thanks to all the political science majors in the audience. I consider myself so privileged to be able to lecture in front of so many political science majors today. Oops, I'm happy to be part of your college political science life, uh, even if only for an uh, Congratulations. I would like to also congratulate APSO for introducing this annual public lecture on political science. It is my hope that the next generation of APSO leaders uh, will continue with this annual public lecture, such that most members will see each other again next year for the APSO's second annual public lecture with a different political science professor speaker and a different topic of national importance but the same lecture celebrating the power of our discipline. For what I see as potentially one of the most important achievements of APSOC's annual public lecture is that through this, Filipino political science majors, most of you guys, hopefully become more self-conscious of the awesome explanatory powers of our discipline. And this is done okay, in one way by being introduced to the best scholarship in political science available to a given topic. Hence, this afternoon, we celebrate our discipline by meeting some of its biggest and most brilliant scholars. To support me in the arguments that I will make on the Duterte administration's federalism and overall constitutional project, I will exclusively employ scholars who are political scientists. We're going to be clannish today. Only political scientists. By political scientists, these are scholars by academic degree or who teach in political science, politics, or government departments or schools. My lecture today has four main aims. The first one is to highlight the pivotal role political science plays through the institutional design literature in political science in assessing the Duterte administration's federalism campaign and the broader constitutional overall project. Second, emphasize to political science majors the importance of adopting a more evidence-based and scholarship-based approach 
when tackling crucial political issues facing the country. The third is to give a working knowledge of a federal political system from its definition to its key institutions. Basically, what on earth is federalism that we always hear about? Four, give fair warning on the grave dangers of constitutional overhauls based on the nature of institutions and institutional change as seen from the vantage point of the institutional design literature. Limitations. Uh, this is just a two-hour lecture. And I will try to compress two UP courses I teach. Uh, the first one is Political Science 127. It's a uh, methodology course. And this semester, I'm actually teaching it. The course focuses introduction to an institutional approach in political science. Uh, the five students are supposed to be here, but I could not find them right now. And also 157, a course that I taught last semester on the federalism project in the Philippines. Disclosure, I do not even get to finish the topics of each course in one semester. I am notorious for this right, too, uh, with my students. So it barely scratches the surface of what needs to be said. Okay? But nevertheless, it is the mapping of the terrain okay, that could hopefully okay, be the start of a good guide. Fifteen time at the Pinano Memorial Lecture, the one talked about by Mr. De Leon. My two-hour lecture today is an expanded and updated version of the one-hour and 20-minute lecture I gave in 2016 as the speaker of the 15th Jaime B. Pin Lecture. Um, the lecture actually has a website if you're interested. Okay, that's the website address, but it's better if you simply Google it. And from there, you could actually download the entire text, okay, the PDF version of the PowerPoint. Also, okay, that would be the PDF version then you might want to check out the photos and I'm proud to show two public intellectuals this would be Professor Randy David okay? two models of public intellectuals the first is Professor Randy David our very own from UP Diliman okay? Department of Sociology Professor uh, Emeritus and then the second one of course is Commissioner Christian Munson okay? Framer of the 1987 Constitution Comelec Chair, member of the Davidi Commission a long time ago. Um, the lecture of that Jaime B. Pin okay, is also available on YouTube if you might want to add to the clicks that could be found on YouTube. I'm saying this because I actually, or we actually plan to come up with also a website for the first half annual public lecture. Um, this is the layout of the poster. And this by chance, a former student, I hope he's here, uh, Mr. Cedric de la Cruz of UP Diliman. I, where is he? Is he here? Anyway, okay, thank you for the beautiful uh, layout. Okay, outline of the lecture. Okay. I'll give you a short introduction to the institutional design literature. Second, what is federalism? Third, three cautionary insights from the institutional design literature for the Federalism Project in the Philippines and the overall Charter Change Campaign. The fourth is, I'll discuss three other cautionary insights, but spend just a few minutes. The third part, I will devote probably close to 40 minutes. Number, uh, the fourth part, probably five or six minutes, okay, because I don't want you walking out on me if it becomes a three or four hour lecture. Let's now have a short introduction to the institutional design of literature. Um, when we say institutional, we mean institutions. And institutions are made up of rules that influence the strategies of state and social actors. Rules can be informal, and they're basically understood as 
social values and norms. Okay? Very powerful social values and norms. And for the most part, they are not written down. I'll give you two sets of examples. Okay? The first is sitting down to a lecture or standing in front to deliver a lecture. Uh, right now, there will be hundreds, more than probably a okay, hundred norms operating as you are listening to my lecture. Audience sits down, lecturer stands up. Audience looks at the lecturer for most part. Lecturer looks at the audience or looks at the slide. Audience does not look at the right, all of you. Okay, or you're not supposed to look at the left. Lecturer does not, is not supposed to look at the ceiling all the time, okay, or the floor. So in this context, there are expectations on what to do. And most of them are actually not written down. Okay. Like for example, now, okay, you are not noticing that I'm following an informal rule which is actually to give enough space, okay, private space to people who listen to me. Okay, you're not noticing it. Okay, and that's how powerful informal norms are. You only notice it if I start violating it. For example, if I start okay, speaking too close to the audience, one member of the audience, you're noticing that there's something wrong. And someone might tell me, Okay, what's wrong with you? Okay, and I would say, why? Because you're not supposed to speak so close to your audience. They're very powerful, we will return to them, but they are not okay, our main okay, uh, priority for this afternoon. Okay, so I have another example. Bribe giving to facilitate government transactions. In some political cultures, some argue even Filipino political culture, giving gifts to facilitate government transactions, okay, it's seen actually not so much as a bribe, but as a gift, as part of the process when you're trying to okay, facilitate a filing of government papers or making okay, a process work that involves government officials. So this would be our examples. But we're not interested or not. They will not give main priority to the informal uh, rules. What we are inter interested in, and we're going to spend the whole afternoon on them, would be the second one. This would be formal rules, okay, the second type of rules. By formal, we mean written down. And they're written down somewhere as laws, regulations, constituted constitution, treaties, and so forth. And we're now ready to meet our first political scientist, okay, Janem Kari. Okay, I could show you his picture from Dartmouth College. And for him, these written down rules are what he called parchment institutions. From his work, parchment, equilibria, and institutions. And the most important parchment uh, institution is the Constitution. The Constitution for two scholars, okay, Alfred Stefan and Cindy Skak, if I may show the picture, okay, one major political scientist, Alfred Stefan, who unfortunately died this year and a younger scholar, Cindy Ska, uh, in their work, Constitutional Frameworks and Democratic Consolidation. Constitution is the most basic institutional framework of a democracy because it creates the fundamental formal rules creating other institutions. Let's have, as an example, the 1987 Philippine Constitution. Through the 1987 Philippine Constitution, the legislative branch is created. Article 6. And then, executive branch, okay, for my Paul Sai 14 students who are here, 
Okay, of course, it would be Article 7. Then, Judicial Branch, Article 8. The constitutional bodies would be Article, okay, in this context, Article 9. And something that we're going to discuss a lot today, Article okay, 10, local government. And other institutions, well, different other institutions. The Constitution, okay, at times, is also called the most important meta-institution of politics. When we say meta-institution, we mean an institution that creates other institutions. So the Constitution is the most important meta-institution. By institutional design, I'll give you the first half of the definition. This would be the differences in the arrangement of formal rules. For example, one basic example in our discipline, the form of government. By form of government, we mean it as the relationship between the two branches, the executive and the legislative branches. If, and we call it a horizontal relation. The institutional design of a country's form of government, if separated is presidential, if fused, what is it? Parliamentary, very, very good. And then if hybrid, we call it semi-presidential. Okay? And okay, there are many varieties also of semi-presidential. If hybrid, semi-presidential. Okay? The second half of the definition of institutional design, you could find in my discussion of the institutional design literature. Okay? In institutional design literature, studies how the design or redesign of a country's political institutions such as the form of government, system of government that we're going to discuss okay, later, electoral system, party system, legislative structure, judicial system, and constitutional bodies. How these institutions, okay, in this context, let's make it simpler, affects or will affect, among others, the accountability, representation, popular empowerment, elite capture, and coherent policy making of the state. By the word design and redesign, okay, there's an element of intentionality. And we could borrow a definition given by a major institutionalist, okay, whom you may have encountered in your readings, in your all-side classes, uh, Johan Olsen. Um, Johan Alsen teaches in the Rina Center for European Studies um, institutional design in democratic context. According to him, institutional design signifies first uh, purposeful and deliberate intervention that succeeds in establishing new institutional structures and processes or rearranging existing ones thereby achieving intended outcomes and improvements. Um, Johan also might ring a bell okay, for some political scientists here because he's the other okay, half of the intellectual partnership with James March. And the two, when they were far younger than the pictures that you see, wrote the classic 1984 article, The New Institutionalism, Organizational factors in political life. Um, other terms for institutional design literature, constitutional engineering literature, constitutional design literature, institutional approach, or new institutionalism. The institutional design literature counts some of the biggest uh, names in the political science discipline. Today's lecture would present arguments from, among others, Jan Carey, whom you already met, Alfred Stepan, you already met, uh, Johan Olson, you already met, then, later, Matthew Sugar, Scott Mainwaring, Giovanni Sartori, Larry Diamond, Stepan Haggard, Robert Kaffman. 
uh, including winners of the Johann Sweden Prize in Political Science. Okay, probably the most prestigious prize in political science. Okay, and, it, and this prize is given to the scholar who, in the view of the foundation, has made the most valuable contribution to political science. Uh, it's based in Uppsala University in Sweden. Um, Labuan Lenz will be mentioned, who won the prize in 1996. Aaron Leibhardt in 1997. Ray Tagepper in 2008, Adam Sporsky in 2010, uh, Pippa Norris in 2011. Uh, the next one is not strictly an institutionalist, but we're going to write, uh, discuss an article of his that deals on institutional design. Okay. Uh, probably you're familiar with it because he has rich scholarship okay, and popular publication, Francis Tokoyama who won the prize in 2015. And then last is Jon Elster, who, whom when I presented the lecture last year, okay, in October 26, just won the prize. Jon Elster in 2016. What is federalism? Okay. It's automated. So what is federalism? Let's start with definition of terms. Uh, once we get the definition right, we're almost half. Okay. Yeah. One of the most famous definitions of federalism is the shortest one. And you may have already heard of this. Okay. We got it, okay. or we get it, from Daniel Elazar, an Israeli political scientist okay. uh, who taught it, okay, in the United States okay, in his 1987 book, Exploring Federalism. Uh, this is the guy, okay, Daniel Elazar. And this is book, um, Exploring Federalism. According to Daniel Elazar, okay, um, you, you might have already encountered this, the simplest possible definition is self rule plus shared root. By self rule plus shared root, this italicized, italicized part is repeated like a mantra in most discussions of federalism. What's federalism? Self-rule plus shared rule. The simplest possible definition. But ironically, as you will find out, nothing is simple here. Self-rule talks about sovereignty. And it's a different uh, definition of sovereignty that you would encounter here. Plus, a shared rule understood as shared sovereignty. And then the word plus is quite tricky because it talks about the interrelationship between the two through shared federal institutions. Now, one of the most useful definitions of federalism, and certainly the most popular done by a political scientist because his work is seminal on federalism, is an American political scientist, William Riker. In his 1987 book, The Development of American Federalism, the definition we're going to use here appears actually almost okay, identical in a 1966 work. But I don't have that book. So we'll use the 87. William Ryder okay, is a pioneer of game theory in the United States. William Ryder and taught in Rochester University, which was a base of game theory. Um, he, and uh, he actually has a prize named after him, the Riker Prize in Political Science, given to practitioners of what they call scientific study of politics, basically public choice and game theory. So William Riker Prize. Uh, it's work, Development of American Federalism. Let's now go to the definition. Okay, so this is actually a paragraph, but I broke it down uh, in easier form okay, so that it would facilitate the discussion. The rule for identification is a, is a constitution is federal if two levels of government rule the same land and people. 
each second, each level has at least one area of action in which it is autonomous. And three, there is some guarantee, even though merely a statement in the Constitution, of the autonomy of each government and its own sphere. Okay. Let us now break down this definition. One of the most useful definitions of federalism. By two levels of government, we could identify this would, what would be understood as okay, in the federalism literature as orders of government. And there would be basically two, central, local. No matter how you term okay, central or local, depending on the federal country, okay, we could reduce it to, ah, this is their central, this is their local. Area of action. This would be understood in the federalism literature as distribution of powers or legislative competences, or some scholars had an eye, competencies or scope or jurisdiction. This would be the area of action. Riker is distinct because he's doing game theory. What he says is at least one area of action. And this is an important qualification. And we're going to discuss, and then later you would also see the strength of this approach. By at least one area of action, federalism can range from highly centralized, like Malaysia, or to highly decentralized, like Brazil, in Latin America. Autonomous. What does autonomous mean? Okay. Riker means it, quote unquote, makes final decisions. And to make sense of this makes final decision, we we'll have to use another definition of Riker. In his 1975 work, it's actually an article, Federalism, Volume 5 of the Handbook of Political Science. I don't have a good thought of the cover, so a little, okay, blurry. But the definition is, federalism is a political organization in which the activities of government are divided between regional governments and a central government in such a way that each kind of government has some activities on which it makes final decisions. So what does makes final decisions? Each kind of government has some activities on which it makes final decisions. We return to our first definition that we use from Riker. This is now sovereignty. Each level okay, means there are two sovereign levels of government in federalism. And this is one aspect of what we mean by shared sovereignty. There are a number. This is one meaning of shared sovereignty in federalism. Thus, okay, we will have number three now, this guarantee of the autonomy of each government in its own sphere is made possible by one institutional document. And that's the document that we talked about as the most important meta-institution. It is the Constitution. So sovereignty of each, of each government in its own sphere is constitutionally guaranteed. So the sovereignty that we're talking about is a constitutional sovereignty. It is not the sovereignty found in sovereign uh, countries of independent states. When we say sovereignty, it's a constitutional one. So to make sense further of this constitutionally guaranteed, we go to a current definition of federalism. This current definition of federalism is from the International okay, Institute for Democracy, Democracy Electoral Assistance in its 2015 primer, Federalism. Uh, IDEA, I'm sure many are familiar with the website, 
It's a very useful website on democracy and electoral assistance. Okay, you might want to check the materials there. They are good publications that you could download. And one of them is a primer on federalism. It's a short work, but very useful. The definition that you could find there is that federalism is a system of government that establishes a constitutionally specified division of powers between different levels of government. You could encounter again the constitutionally specified division of powers, but I'm raising this because it has the term system of government. And, it's the, and it is the one that I want to develop. In political science, although not consistently, when we mean, when we say, I mean, system of government, it, we mean it to be a relationship between the central government and the local government. Okay, so in this context, local government, and you could anticipate that the relationship okay, is going to be a vertical one. Okay, you saw the horizontal earlier. This one is vertical. Some scholars might not be consistent. They might say system or in, uh, uh, interchange system and form of government. But I think all scholars working on federalism and decentralization talks about vertical relationship. Okay. Um, in this lecture, to make it simpler for us and more consistent, when we mean system of government, we mean Okay, that vertical relation. So this okay, is now, when we say unitary system of government, the central government is the single central source of authority. Uh, it is the one that makes final decisions. There is a single sovereign recognized by the Constitution. Powers can be delegated. So we could imagine it in terms of this downward arrow. But in the final analysis, the local government is subordinate to the central government. A unitary system can range from highly centralized. For example, that's of Singapore, which is a city-state. In, in this context, um, no powers are actually delegated. Or a unitary system can be highly decentralized, like Norway, wherein many powers are delegated. And we could have okay, a thicker arrow to depict the relationship. Okay. A unitary system can be, in fact, be more decentralized than some centralized federal systems. Very important to understand this point. Like, for example, okay, in our backyard, Indonesia is actually more decentralized than the federal Malaysia. But still, Indonesia remains as a unitary system of government. Why? Because the many powers that are delegated, this is the important may also be revoked by the central government. So, that's the visual representation. Okay. A unitary system can even have constitutionally protected autonomous regions. Okay. We, in the literature, at times it's called constitutionally decentralized unions. Like, for example, Italy. But, since the central government is still the one that makes the final decisions when push comes to shove, it's still a unitary system of government. Let's go now to a federal system of government. Okay? And we could use Riker's definition and the two other definitions that we have encountered. Okay? In certain policy areas where central government has exclusive jurisdiction, the central government is the sovereign. It is the one that makes the final decision. In certain policy areas where local government has exclusive jurisdiction, it is the local government that is 
then somewhere. So in this context, we could have this relation, which doesn't have an arrow, they were direction. Powers cannot be revoked by the central government for the simple fact that the powers did not come from the central government. They are not delegated by the central government to the local government, but they are derived from where? Yes, the Constitution, but guaranteed by the Constitution. And it is this that separates the unitary from federal one. So we return. Again, federalism can be highly centralized. An example is Venezuela. Or it can be, okay, I'm supposed to represent, okay, with a thin arrow. Or highly decentralized, like the United States. Where a lot of functions are actually uh, assumed by the state governments. In certain policy areas where both governments have jurisdiction, and we call it concurrent or shared, um, the relationship between the central government okay, and the local government could be diagram this way. Um, and it's not because I'm, I'm a bad layout artist and I could not make, get them straight. Okay? It's actually because there's actually something about this relationship and we call it federal paramount seal. Wherein if there is, in most instances, if there's a conflict between the central and the local government, it is a central government okay? or central government's legislation that takes precedence. Okay, so now let's go to the list of federal countries. Okay, this should be interesting because when I started studying about federalism, I actually had no idea okay, on which countries are actually federal and non-federal. Okay, so let's do Handbook, Handbook of Federal Countries in 2005. Okay, so this is the book by the Forum of Federation. It's a little dated 2005. Um, the Forum Federation has a website, also useful. Uh, you could also download uh, articles or books on federalism if you're interested with the topic. Um, it, lists, it listed 25 federal countries. So Argentina, Australia, uh, Austria, Belgium, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Brazil, Canada, Comoros, Ethiopia, Germany. India, Malaysia, Mexico, Federated States of Micronesia, Nigeria, Pakistan, Russia, Serbia and Montenegro, South Africa, Spain, St. Kitts, Navis, Switzerland, United Arab Emirates, United States, and Venezuela. Uh, we, we actually have media kits on this, so you don't have to copy because they're quite they're humorous. Okay. Um, Serbia and Montenegro, uh, is no longer federal because Montenegro has become independent in 2006. Then some eyebrows might be raised because South Africa and Spain are listed by the Forum of Federation as federal. Some people would not agree, but let's not go into that. Okay, let's just work on their uh, classification or selection. Let us update this Forum of Federation, same site, in November 2017. And a new, an updated website shop of the, web, of the uh, website. Um, in 2007, it lists 24 federal countries. 24. And let me just okay, uh, make sure that I clarify, okay, uh, I think, okay, a confusion because you might go to the website because I recommend it. It says there are 25. But then when you go to the drop-down menu and you count, only 24. Okay, so the 24 listed okay, are these. And it adds Iraq, Nepal, and Sudan. That's still 24. So that means okay, three were actually taken up. Serbia and Montenegro already taken up earlier. Not in the list, Comoros, 
Federated States of Micronesia, and St. Kitts and Nevis. Um, so the provisional list that we could work on would be 27. There are 27 federal countries, more or less. These 27 federal countries cover 40% of the world's population. Because you might have noticed, a number of them are large countries. Okay. According to the United States okay, Bureau of Census, six countries are in the top ten most populous countries. China is not federal. So what is number two? Uh, start letter I. Of course, it would be India. Number uh, three would be the United States. Number five would be the biggest country in South America, Brazil. Six, Pakistan. Seven is the biggest country in Africa, Nigeria. And nine would be Russia. So this would be the six largest countries. Although uh, there are only 27 in all, and cover 40% of the world's population, they constitute a minority of the total of 195 states. According to Freedom House, Freedom, House, Freedom in the World 2016, this is the work that classifies a country, whether it is, it fulfills the classification of an electoral democracy. By electoral democracy, its most important leaders are selected through competitive popular elections. Um, 18 out of 27 of federal states are electoral democracies, constituting 67%. Not all federal countries are democracies. Very important to remember this. Once we discuss the relation between federalism and okay, democratic performance. Um, it's, import it's more important for us to actually focus on which countries are not electoral democracies. And this would be Ethiopia, Iran, Malaysia, Nigeria, Pakistan, Russia, Sudan, United Arab Emirates, and Venezuela. What's the percentage if we go to unitary states? 107 out of 168 of unitary states are electoral democracies. Okay, about 64%. Not much difference with the federal states. Let's go to the Human Development Index, uh, International Human Development Indicators. Um, the, the HDI would be one of the most accurate or the better indicators, economic indicators, because it combines three indices, the Life Expectancy Index, Education Index, and the GNI Index to come up with the Human Development Index. The Philippines okay, uh, Index is 0 .68, 0 0.682, which actually places us in the bottom half of the HDI at rank 116 out of 188 countries. So we're not doing that well. But you might be quite surprised. In comparison to the 27 federal states, especially if you're familiar with how proponents of federalism in this country sell federal states as superior to unitary states, a simple comparison with the Philippines, which is not even doing well in HDI. Philippines has a better HDI score than more than one-third of these federal countries. Uh, ten countries would be Philippines better than Comoros, Ethiopia, India, Iraq, Micronesia, Nepal, Nigeria, Pakistan, South Africa, and Sudan. This would become more dramatic if we start okay, breaking down the classification if we consider only federal states in Asia. If we do that, Philippines has a better HDI score than more than half of these federal countries, five out of eight countries. Now, if we consider uh, only federal states in Asia, that are electoral democracies, there's actually only one country 
that is doing better okay, than the Philippines in terms of HDI score. It's important to remember okay, the diversity of federal countries is important to keep in mind when you listen to proponents of federalism in the Philippines. We'll keep on highlighting just a few well-performing federal countries. Germany okay, is a favorite of them. Malaysia, Switzerland, United States, and Australia. If you listen to the proponents. Okay, while ignoring the more problematic ones identified by the virus literature. Institutional design literature, democratization literature, East literature, ethnic okay, nationality literature, Argentina, Brazil, Comoros, Ethiopia, Iraq, Mexico, Nepal, Nigeria, Pakistan, Russia, South Africa, lately Spain with its Catalonia problem, Sudan with its okay, peace problem, okay, and Venezuela, which is considered as the past case of federalism like now. Okay, a resource-rich country, okay, a country rich in oil, but because of its political crisis, it's 74% of its population in one survey listed that they have lost 18 pounds okay? uh, involuntarily. They were not dieting because of hunger. Venezuela is a federal. Let's do now the institutional features of federalism. Okay, so this section is mainly based on Ronald Watts' 1996 book comparing federal systems in the 1990s. Uh, let me share to you a photo of uh, um, Professor Watts, who unfortunately died in 2015, okay, uh, taught in Queen's University. Uh, many texts in the slides are direct quotes from the book. I did not rewrite many of his terms because of the technical nature of his arguments. And I'm also going to use the primer of IDEA, federalism, and also one article by an Australian uh, political scientist in the Oxford Handbook of Political Institutions. Very good handbook that you could download on the internet. Um, it's Comparative Federalism by Professor Brian Galligan, who teaches in Melbourne, the University of Melbourne. So let's do uh, six common institutional features of federal systems according to Ronald Watts. Different scholars list different numbers of common or essential features of federalism. Watts lists six common features that we're going to discuss this afternoon. Um, Brian Galligan lists four. Um, an older political scientist, Ivo Duchesen, in his comparative federalism work, lists eight. So if you want a shorter reading, don't do Duchesen, go for uh, and Duchesek uh, calls these eight features yardsticks of federalism. Uh, let's do now the six common features of ones. The first is orders of government. There are two orders of government, each directly, each acting directly on their citizens. These two orders of government is the first one, the federal level, aka federal, if you're doing the United States or Germany, central, South Africa, union government, India, national, okay, Sudan. And then you would have the other one, a constituent level, which, okay, also known as states, if you're doing Federal countries like Australia, Malaysia, the United States, provinces, examples, Argentina, Canada. Okay, so you might hear their provinces, but you might think they're like our provinces here in the country. No, okay, they're their constituent levels. Regions, example, Belgium. Cantons, okay, Switzerland. Autonomous communities, Spain. And lender, if you're talking of Austria and Germany. Aside 
from Belgium, which has divisions in terms of linguistic communities. All are geographically or territorially defined. So one tip about federalism, you could think of it as a vertical relation, you could also think of it as a geographic distribution of power. And this is illustrated by the diagram of the German okay, Federal Republic, where it has 16 constituent states, or in the German language, Länder. So let's do now distribution of powers. Um, according to Watts, a formal constitutional distribution of powers and allocation of revenue resources between the two orders of government. Let's do distribution of powers, a aka jurisdiction, also known as legislative competences. Terms that we encountered with Riker's earlier definition. Distribution of powers involves the distribution of legislative powers and executive powers between the federal and the constituent governments. By legislative powers, they vary in terms of form and scope. By form, we mean, okay, these are the things that okay, I've already mentioned okay, when I discuss the system of government. Exclusive powers, um, what would be the second? Okay, where they're actually shared in this context. Concurrent legislative powers. And the last, okay, which is actually a left leftover category, and starts letter R, yes, okay, residual. So in this context, residual legislative powers. This would be your form. In terms of exclusive legislative powers, they're exclusive because they're assigned only to either the federal government or the constituent government. Concurrent legislative powers are powers shared between the federal and the constituent governments. Shared, aka shared legislative powers. They may be legislated by both the federal and the constituent government. In case of conflicts between them, in most instances, federal legislation prevails over constituent legislation, or what is termed federal paramountcy. Residual legislative powers identify which order of government has jurisdiction over matters not specified in the Constitution as either exclusive or concurrent. This jurisdiction okay, would be given to federal government, usually in federations created by the process of devolution from a former unitary state. And what kind of federalism is this? And supposedly this is the type of federalism we're going to get if we federalize. It is the holding together federalism. Holding together federalism. And examples are India, Belgium, Canada, Nepal, and Nigeria. The other one would be constituent governments. Residual powers are given to constituent governments, usually in federations created by the process of aggregating previously separate units. And I could see some of my students, I could actually ask them. Um, this would be your, Ms. Ignacio? Yes, that's the coming together federalism. Uh, I call it trauma day, remember the lessons. And the example would be Australia, Austria, Germany, Switzerland, and the US. Where well, these are actually already existing states, that form themselves into federation. Okay? They retain their power okay? As, uh, in terms of residual okay? uh, separation of powers. Okay? When, when we talk about scope, 
this would be the areas of jurisdiction. Defense, taxing powers, immigration, social affairs, international relations, interregional transportation, economy, and monetary union, maintenance of law and security, etc. etc. Okay, I have a chart from IDEA that talks about distribution of powers in a sample of federal countries. Okay, we have countries in Australia, Canada, Malaysia, Nigeria, Pakistan, South Africa. Um, you might notice when it comes to foreign affairs and defense, all are federal. Although South Africa is the term central. But when we start going down to the police, you would notice that in Australia, defense federal, police becomes shared. Canada, federal becomes shared. And also Pakistan, federal units. Um, criminal justice, shared Australia. Units Canada, Malaysia federal, Nigeria shared. Pakistan units, South Africa central, but then for those who are going to be lawyers here, because I know OSA is an excellent uh, pre law course, look at this, come civil justice, it's a different story for a number of countries. In Canada, it becomes shared. Then in Nigeria, from shared, it becomes units. So diversity, and we're just talking of six countries. In education, primary, you have this election. But when it comes to your tertiary level, college level universities, Australia and Nigeria different. Primary Australia units, it becomes shared from university. In Nigeria, units become shared. And then South Africa, shared, it becomes exclusively. Center. Let's go to health and welfare, security, social security. We have this election. When it comes to hospital, again, some shifting. Federal, unit to units in Australia, units to share in Canada, then Nigeria, unspecified to share, South Africa, central to share. And you might have noticed Malaysia, it's a federal country, but highly centralized. It's all federal. Economic, let's do trade and industry, all shared, except South Africa. Tourism, all shared. Except, at least without, yeah, all shared, okay, central, but the shifting central trade and industry becomes shared interest. Let's now discuss distribution of power still. Okay. This would be something that you would hear in the federalism discussion. The difference between symmetrical and asymmetrical. We start with symmetrical. Symmetrical simply means all constituent governments, all the states, have equal juridical status and powers. Asymmetrical, um, and there are okay, at least two types. Okay, one is political symmetry. Let's do constitutional symmetry. Means differences in the status of legislative and executive powers assigned by the Constitution to the constituent governments. One example, one type of constitutional symmetry is to increase, just increase the jurisdiction autonomy of particular constituent states. And actually, okay, Malaysia has this. In terms of concessions made to the Borneo states, Sabah and Sarawak, when they joined the Malaysian Federation in 1963. Uh, let's do now allocation of revenue resources. And this would be first, tax collection and revenue raising powers. And second, intergovernmental financial transfers. Together, they are known as fiscal federalism, which is the, also at the heart 
of the federalism debate in this country. Fiscal federalism, in fact, should be a separate lecture altogether because of its complexity. Um, let's do first, oops, sorry, tax collection and revenue raising powers. Okay, let's just go through the uh, HR, okay, the chart, just to give us an idea of the taxing powers that are shared between federal and uh, constituent states. Yeah, in this context, actually, within federal and shared powers. My notice come customs, different arrangement for federal, depending on the country, Belgium can carry. Then excise, also different. In terms of corporate income, different arrangement. Personal income, different arrangement. Sales, different arrangement. Foreign borrowing, okay, distribution of debt and borrowing powers. In terms of foreign borrowing, some countries do not allow their constituent states, constituent states to borrow, like for example, Austria, India, and Malaysia. But some country, countries actually allow, okay, both federal and uh, constituent, like Canada, United States, Switzerland, Germany, Spain, and Pakistan. But when it comes to domestic borrowing, a lot more lenient. Let's do second, intergovernmental financial transfers. Okay. This would be, uh, you might have encountered this already, the term equalization transfers. The other one is, would be solidarity transfers, composed of conditional and unconditional grants, uh, think of them as roughly similar to the internal revenue allotment of the Philippines. Um, fiscal imbalances that every federalism has to correct. There are actually two. Let's do the first, vertical imbalances. Uh, federalism scholars do not really have that much imagination, vertical, horizontal. Let's do the vertical imbalances. This would be basically imbalances between Constitutionally assigned revenues for the federal and constituent governments are not in sync with the constitutionally assigned expenditure responsibilities for federal and constituent governments. Why is this so? The main reason for the vertical imbalance, the allocation of major taxing powers are actually given to the federal governments. But when it comes to expenditures for expensive social services, they are actually given to constituent states. And that's a complaint that you will encounter against the local government code of the country in terms of decentralization. Okay. So, well now, number two, horizontal imbalances. This would be basically imbalances among the constituent states. So, revenue capacities of different constituent uh, governments vary. And compared to the inability of constituent governments to provide their citizens with services at the same level. These are your regional imbalances. Correcting the horizontal and vertical imbalances. This will be done to financial transfers from one level of government to another. Federal governments, constituent governments, with the financial transfers, the arrow goes from federal to constituent governments, except for one country okay, uh, wherein the transfer is from one constituent government to another constituent government bec and because they do not tolerate inequality, and that is, of course, Germany. Okay, Germany has an interstate financial transfer, which would be very interesting to study for those interested on federalism. These financial transfers could be conditional transfers, meaning that the federal government transfers to consider governments that have conditions attached to them. That's why they're called conditional. And the other one would be unconditional transfers. This would be federal transfers to consider governments that have no conditions attached to them, much like your IRA in this country. Uh, I just want to share to you three 
types of mortgages in terms of uh, financial transfers. The United States actually does not have a generalized equalization scheme. That's why they could actually tolerate a high level of inequality among their states, among their 50 states. Switzerland is different. Federal transfers based on a formula involving a range of criteria ranking and cantons by financial capacity as the basis for tax sharing and conditional grants. But the equalizing transfer system is smaller than in Germany, Canada, and Australia. And then Germany, primarily interstate transfers. Okay, we're done with that technical thing. Let us now do something something more familiar by capitalism. Our stuff, all side. The provision for the designated representation of distinct regional views within the federal policy-making institutions, usually provided by the particular form of the federal second chamber. The second chamber is the principle of bicameralism in federalism. Except for two countries, it is bicameralism, except for two countries that we encountered, the United Arab Emirates and the microstates, St. Kitts and Levis, all are bicameral. Okay, all are bicameral legislatures. Federalism is bicameralism. And these exceptions actually prove the rule because UAE is actually an authoritarian regime. They operate differently from democratic regimes. And St. Kitts and Levis is a microstate. It's not that problematic not to have a upper, an upper house. Uh, just to give as an idea how small St. Kitts and Levis, okay, a dual island in the Caribbean with a population of, can you see, 54,000. In the context of the Philippines, this is a really small population. And even in Quezon City, the third um, top 10 populist barangays in Quezon City are all federal. No, uh, they're all bigger than the St. Kitts and the Barangay Commonwealth, Bay to Bahay So you go, if you're living in those barangays, perhaps you could recommend that they become bicameral. So St. Kitts and the So these are just microstates, it's not a problem. Okay. Um, unlike the first chamber, the second chamber is the legislative institution which operates on the basis of representation as states. That's why distinct regional views within the federal policy-making institutions. Um, it is the most distinct shared rule in institution of federalism. Uh, i just give you three examples. In, in my federalism class, we discuss a number. And I've chosen them for because they're quite different. Canada has an appointed Senate. That's why, it, although it has a number of powers, because it is simply appointed, it's actually run as a weak uh, upper house, okay? which we can discuss later. Okay? Constitutionally, you could be powerful, but if you're not elected, okay, you don't have the same legitimacy. It's the United States up to 1913, okay? we're actually nominated by state legislatures. Now you're familiar with the United States, uh, okay, or the upper house of the United States, okay, that is directly elected. And then Germany, okay, would, uh, Germany's Bundestag, okay, wherein state governments are actually ex officio members of the Bundestag. That is weighted in terms of representation. Smallest states, three, and based on the population, it goes to four, five, and six. Okay, so you have Canada there, as I mentioned, then the United States, in terms of direct elections, Germany, okay, ex official official of the lander governments. Okay, let's do now constitutional catch. We're almost there, we have number four. This is a very important concept, constitutional entrenchment. A supreme written constitution, not unilaterally amendable, requiring the consent 
of a significant proportion of the constituent units. Not unilaterally amendable. This is the principle of constitutional entrenchment of federalism. It's so important your speaker okay, embolden it and then underlined it. Constitutional entrenchment. In plain English, very difficult to amend its federal character. Once federal, very difficult. And in fact, we will qualify this later. Okay, let's do this. The amendments of the Constitution that affects its federal character, okay, for most federal countries, okay, like for example, distribution of power, okay, which state okay, or um, which what level of government gets jurisdiction, require the involvement of all orders of government. Most federations require approval in both houses of the federal legislature in terms of simple majority for certain countries, Switzerland and Canada. Simple majority is 50% plus one of the quorum. Or absolute majority, like Australia. Uh, when you say absolute majority, it is 50% plus one of what? Okay, my poll side 14 students, of all members. And then special majority or also known as supermajority. Anything about 50% plus one of all members is a special majority. It would be two thirds, three fourths, four fifths. That would be your special majority. US, India, and Malaysia. Okay, for example, in the United States, you need, you need two thirds okay, majority of members of both houses of Congress. And it does not end there, plus, Approval either by a special majority of the constituent unit legislatures, for example, the United States, Canada, India, and Malaysia. If in the US is two thirds for Congress, both houses, in terms of state legislatures, it's three fourths. Very difficult. Or by a referendum requiring a double majority, which is a nice term to learn. What is a double majority, also known as federally weighted, meaning that it's federal countries that do this for the most part. You have overall majority and overall okay, majorities in a majority of constituent units. Okay, so first is overall majority, and second, majorities in a majority okay, of constituent units. And Switzerland and Australia practice this. Uh, I have to qualify what? Because in some federal constitutions, or some federal constitutions actually have eternity, eternity clauses for their federal uh, character. This means the clauses that cannot be changed by amendment. Meaning it is built in the constitution that you could not change them. Two major federal countries that have them would be Brazil and Germany. So, in this context, in certain cases, it is not possible to revoke. It is not possible to revoke. In a way, in short, uh, there is forever in federalism. Because it is there, there. some federal, uh, uh, constitutions of eternity clauses. Okay, let's have adjudication now. Two more. An umpire in the form of courts or provision for referendums to rule of disputes between governments. Okay, this umpire, rule of disputes between governments, become even more necessary in federations. Why? Because you could expect a lot of conflicts in the jurisdiction. Who's responsible for what? An availability of overlaps of jurisdiction between governments and the consequent likelihood of intergovernmental conflict and competition. There would always be a need for process to adjudicate disputes and resolve conflict and resolve conflict. Okay, this process can be via popular referendum, as you will find in Switzerland, 
or simply judicial. Uh, the two uh, governments sue each other. And that is why one criticism of federalism is the concept of judicialization of politics. Okay, the two governments keep on suing each other. One is responsible for that. Okay. Okay. Uh, and in terms of courts, federal countries have two types of courts. One is Supreme Court, um, final adjudica adjudicator in relation to all laws, including the Constitution. Um, examples would be US, Canada, Australia, India, Malaysia, and Australia. And what is the second time? Okay. Um, would be, yes, constitutional courts. And constitutional courts are courts that specialize on constitutional issues. It specializes in constitutional interpretation. And you have Belgium, uh, Germany, Belgium, and the country that ruled that the referendum of Catalonia was actually unconstitutional. Okay. And last, intergovernmental collaboration, where you have process and institutions to facilitate intergovernmental collaboration for those areas where governmental responsibilities are shared or inevitably overlap. This intergovernmental collaboration has two important dimensions, interunit relations and relations within federal unit governments because there are many states now they need to cooperate and coordinate with each other. That's why you have a plethora of um, institutional arrangements to coordinate these relations. The questionnaire insights from the institutional design literature. Whenever I drink the slide, okay, actually, makes it chance. The cautionary insights from the institutional design literature. Okay, let's do the first cautionary insight. Uh, there is no consensus on the superiority of one system of government um, to another. Uh, there is no consensus on the superiority of the federal to the unitary system of government. Or, okay, although it's not my topic, let me insert it, parliamentary semi-presidential to the presidential form of government. But I discussed the, just discussed the federal. Okay, or vice versa, meaning unitary superior to federal. No such thing okay, for many scholars. While many scholars in the institutional design literature argue for the superiority of a federal to a unitary system, and many of these scholars, they are also okay, the very best scholars. In fact, we have many met some of them. Okay, examples of top political scientists. Alfred Stefan okay, is pro-federal. Okay, and one of his work, one of his most famous work, is federalism and democracy beyond the U.S. model. Aaron Leithart, a winner of the Johan Switter Prize that I already mentioned, is pro federal. Okay, and is one of the most important scholars of the institutional design uh, uh, literature. Uh, in his work, Patterns of Democracy, which I highly recommend, okay, it is pro federal. Uh, Pippa Norris, who won the Johan Switter Prize that I already mentioned, okay, taught in Harvard is pro-federal. It is, in her important work, Driving Democracy, okay, you could do chapter seven. It's a strong argument on federalism. If you're a pro-federal, you might want to read the work. Okay. Larry Diamond, the Larry Diamond, okay, a major democratization scholar, okay, actually backs for the superiority of federalism over a um, uh, unitary system. Larry Diamond, okay, this is the picture of Larry Diamond, Paul of Larry Diamond. But many scholars, also in the same institutional design literature, deny the superiority of a federal to a unitary system. Examples of top political scientists, and there are also many of them. Daniel Treisman, a political scientist working in UCLA, uh, University of California, uh, California. It's Angeles. Okay. He is architecture of government, okay, which I, of course, highly recommend. Recommend. Okay. One of the most okay, comprehensive work on a critique, not only of federalism, but actually the merits of decentralization. 
uh, Jan Eric Lane and Swan Elson. Okay, let me show you their photos. Okay. Eric Lane is a professor of political science in Switzerland. And Swan Elson teaches in Umeå University, uh, Department of Political Science. Uh, in their also important work, also booklet work, New Institutional Economics, Performance and Politics. Um, Jonathan Rodden, whom you would encounter a number of times because he reviews the literature in federalism. Uh, professor of Political Science in Stanford University. His important book, Hamilton's Paradox, The Promise and Peril of Fiscal Federalism. We are, you'll also encounter an article of his later on. Then Eric Wibbles um, teaches in Duke University, also a political scientist. In his article in the Annual Review of Political Science, I hope you're familiar with this journal. Okay, every year it, launch, it releases an annual review of the state of the discipline in 2006 on federalism, okay, written by Eric Wibbles. Yes, 2006. Okay, these scholars find that there is no meaningful difference in the performance between federal and unitary systems on a number of key indicators. For example, human development, economic performance, including quite surprisingly, fiscal performance, okay, the public finance, income inequality, third, democratic stability, for yes, I think I remember, four, democratic stability, fifth, quality of democracy, sixth, rule of law, seven, anti-corruption, eight, handling multi-ethnic uh, multi conflicts, despite your pricing. In fact, for a few scholars, their works show that unitary systems do better than federal ones in some of these indicators. We can organize the counter-arguments of the critics of the federal superiority camp via two intertwined institutional arguments. The first one is institutional bundle. The term institutional bundle is mine, okay? but I think it's a useful term to make sense of what the scholars are doing. When we say institutional bundle, we could, we could think the, uh, the system of government as a package of institutional features whose performance depends on the specific design of the structures. In federal, just a few examples, you have encountered distribution of legislative executive powers. Well, how the federal system or the federal country would perform would actually depend on how the powers of the executive legislative are actually distributed as well as the set, uh, distribution between the federal and the state level. The type of constitutional entrenchment, the design of the upper house, mechanisms for intergovernmental coordination. Similarly, unitary, its performance would depend on the manner of recruitment in the national local bureaucracy, appointment budgetary powers of the president uh, to or over the bureaucracy, level and type of decentralization, and level type of evolution. The key argument here is that the devil is in the details. It would depend on the specific design of each package of the institutional bundle, okay, and that would actually give you an indication of how the federal system and unitary system would work at the level of the bundle. So in this context, at the level of institutional bundle, it helps explain performance. Number two is more popular in the institutional design literature. This is the concept of institutional configuration. One of the most important concepts that I could share. By institutional configuration is that how different types of institutions affect each other. This means, okay, for example, how the electoral system affects the form of government. The important lesson here is that you must never analyze institutions 
independently from each other. There's no such thing as form of government alone. In order to understand executive level relations in a country, how it performs, you have to understand how the electoral system works and how the party system works. And that's what okay, they mean by institutional configuration. As I said, institutional configuration, one of the most important insights of the institutional design literature. Because in the final analysis, you could not isolate one type of institution to another. There are linguistic shortcuts. Okay? You might get misled to think that because you have the word, okay, they, they exist different uh, separately. No, they actually overlap each other in real life. So, I uh, two scholars who have been impressing me the importance of institutional configuration are two major institutional design scholars, Matthew Sugar, teaching in the University of California, and Scott Mayer Wari, Kelly Institute for International Studies. So you might want, for those who have not yet encountered them, you might want to read them. I learned my institutional configuration from them. And one important work that they have, 1997, you might have already encountered this work, Presidential Assembly and Democracy in Latin America, the thinking in the terms of the debate, you will encounter this article again once we go to the Philippine Federalism. Okay, this is the book that they edited. I already mentioned this, Jonathan Srogan's work on federalism. The main worry is sugar on forms of government, this one on um, systems of government. In institutional configuration, system of government, the performance was also affected by the design of other institutions. For example, in federal system of government, and just one pair of examples, the party system. The party system, in turn, would be affected or would be composed, whether it's a two-party system, a multi-party system, whether the party system is regionalized, meaning that the organization of the parties are based at the, at the state level or non-regionalized, a more national organization of political parties. And okay, this would affect the federal system of government. The party system, in turn, is affected by the electoral system. It's one of the basic tenets of institutional design. Party system okay, affected by the electoral system, whether your, S uh, your electoral system is SMD, meaning single member district, or proportional representation, and depending on the type of formula of your PR, or your uh, MM, um, your mixed member electoral system, that would affect, in turn, the party system, that would affect the federal system of government. Okay. And the devil is in the details. Same principle when you do unitary system. So, in terms of institutional configuration, at the level of institutional configuration, it helps explain performance. So we're done with two, let's work on the third. Besides these institutional factors, so institutional bundle, institutional configuration, scholars also raise non-institutional factors. Uh, examples would be the political culture, this would be your non-formal institutions, like for example how the public views uh, bribe giving uh, in relation to government, the length of your democracy, political elite composition, is it dynastic based or non-dynastic, is it regionally based or non-regional, level of economic development, colonial heritage, the most important is British colonial heritage, type of ethnic fragmentation, is it territorially based or dispersed? Does it tend to be violent or non-violent? Pan-dependence, what happened at a certain moment of history? Like for example, 1986, what happened in 1986 that explains later on what's happening now for us in 2016 and 2017. Geographical location, are you near okay, water areas? Are you part of the European Union? All of this. Okay, are considered to affect institutional performance in addition to 
institutional factors. Together, they're known as institutional heterogeneity. And we have the three components that we need later on to discuss the three caution on the third cautionary insight. Okay, so I know a lot of concepts are being shared out, but the, the, uh, once we go further, once we discuss our own federal campaign, we're going to use institutional bundle, institutional configuration, and institutional heterogeneity to show to you how problem problematic the federalism campaign of the current Duterte administration. So let me just wrap up this argument on institutional and non-institutional. It is this particular combination of institutional and non-institutional factors that explain the performance of a federal or unitary system. Let's do the second uh, questionnaire insight before not overhaul. The recommendation of top scholars for democratic countries with already functioning systems of, or forms of government okay, or any major political institutions is to reform rather than overhaul their systems or forms of government or even their major political institutions. What are major political institutions? Electoral systems, okay, party systems. Let's do my scholarship first, or our scholarship first. Top scholars, examples, as Sugar and Mainwari, already mentioned, Stefan Haggard and Robert Kaufman, two political scientists. Okay, let's have Stefan Haggard, okay, teaching in one of the okay, solid institutional design departments in the United States, University of California at San Diego, and okay, his collaborator, uh, Robert Kaufman. The challenges of consolidation, which we're going to use later in an important argument. And their book, The Political Economy of Democratic Transitions, which when I was still a student, okay, I actually used. And it won a Liberty Prize for the best book in comparative politics in 1995. Rain Tagebara, who won the Johann Sweeter Prize, who's actually a physics uh, PhD uh, graduate, but uh, doing political science. Um, Rain Tagapara, research professor, political science. Okay. Designing electoral rules and waiting for an electoral system. And Francis Pokoyam, in this book. Okay. Uh, who teaches in Stanford, won the John Street Prize, as I mentioned, in addition to other awards. Uh, it is important article or paper development and the limits of institutional design. Okay, let's go to the argument. The revival of institutional design questions actually has a historical context. Uh, is linked with the most recent wave of democratization. But in, from 1974 to 1994, in a period of 20 years, about 75 countries transited to democracies, many from authoritarian to democratic, some becoming independent and having to have a new regime. And most of them, of course, chose democratic, including one country, in 1986, you know. These institutional design questions, okay, of, um, these new countries face fundamental institu uh, institutional choices. Um, and the most important is the form of government. And the, import the most important work by far on this question is the role of one late 1990 article, Perils of Presidentialism which you may have encountered in your region. The classic parents of presidentialism of one day. Um, this argument would be picked up by Filipino parliamentary advocates by mid-1990s, when we have already made our choice of form of government in the 1987 constitution. By new democracies, these regimes in transition 
have no option but to make these constitutional choices. And the difficulty and danger of these choices are captured by the subtitle of Jan Elser et al.'s book on post-communist transitions in Eastern Europe. This is institutional design in post-communist states. And the subtitle is Rebuilding the Ship at Sea. No, the, it is not repair, it is to rebuild the ship. Okay? It is very dangerous. Some would even say it could not be done. But why would these countries do this? Because they have no, they have no choice. Because they're making the transition from authoritarian to democratic regimes. These are countries that, that are out at sea. The ship is destroyed or damaged. You have to rebuild it. These are the new democratic regimes. And we did, okay, we had that experience in 1986 when we rebuilt our own ship at sea. Even for many scholars, arguing the superiority of parliamentary and or federal, there is no recommendation to dump existing presidential or unitary systems. Some do, but many scholars, they do not. It's a scholarly debate for them. Let's do parliamentary presidential, and there's no one bigger than Adam Sworsky on democratic survivability. Uh, uh, this is Adam Sworsky, teaching in National NYU, uh, professor of politics, winner of the Yuan as Rita Price also. Uh, this work, What Makes Democracy Secure, is probably uh, one of the most cited, if not, if not the most cited work, on the superiority of parliamentary systems to presidential systems on democratic survivability. Parliamentary democracy survived longer than presidential democracies. Okay? But what is interesting is that not only is there no recommendation to shift, but according to Adam Sworsky, if you're a new presidential democracy, do not attempt to shift to parliamentary system. Okay? Because you're going to open really tough distributional conflicts that, are, that may destroy your society. Uh, so the next, uh, let's have federal unitary. Okay. Uh, we're, we'll have a German scholar, Uther Wagner for Schmidt. Uh, okay, unfortunately I don't have a photo. Uh, that's the logo that is faced uh, in their work, Federalism and Political performance. Okay. In this work, okay, it, the scholars, the authors, the contributors explore okay, the superiority of a federal system to a unitary system on a number of indicators, okay, but still, no, no recommendation to share. Uh, the analogy that I use in the IUB on Bean lecture is the analogy of Sagada versus Manila. You think of federalism as Sagada. For those who have already gone to Sagada, who oh, have beautiful the faces, okay? How okay, clear the waters and the air, how tranquil it looks, okay? Great to be there. But it's very different to actually recommend that you pattern Manila over Sagada, okay? Or like Sagada. That's a different thing. You might actually like federalism, but it's a different thing to recommend it for a unitary state. Why? For a number of reasons that we're going to discuss later. Okay. Overhaul. Okay. Among the reasons why strongly discourage, the first one is unnecessary. If there is no superiority, then there is no need for overhaul. Reform will suffice. The second one is unbelievable. Tasks are too institutionally and intellectually complex for the lofty goals that the proponents talk about. Okay, and we're going to break down this argument. 
institutionally. We talked about the institutional bundle. We also talked about institutional configuration. In order to have a well-functioning federal system, you actually must consider also the institutional bundle and the institutional configuration. And we are not yet discussing institutional indigeneity, such that, especially for federalism, which is actually more complex than the horizontal relation of a shift from a presidential to parliamentary. When you talk of federalism, you're going to talk about changes in state governments. You're, in fact, not changes. You're going to introduce state governments, constitutions, courts, bureaucracy, etc. Okay, that need to be created. Uh, the Philippine time frame, depending on which proposed federal constitution uh, you read, and we have had four, at least four federal constitutions introduced since 2005. Okay, Jose Abuebo's Citizens Movement for a Federal Philippines in 2005. So this would be the 2005 constitution. Aquilino Pimentel's et al's Senate Joint Resolution Number 10 in 2008. This Aquilino Pimentel's constitution, federal constitution. The newer one, 2016, by two congressmen. Uh, resolution of both houses, 008, RBH 008. And then, yeah, that's the one page. And then the Federalism Study Group of the PDP Lab and Federalism Institute in August 2017. This is the front page of that proposed constitution, okay, done by a study group uh, which includes some university professors. Okay, so depending on which you read, like Abueva, at least 10 years, at least. That would be far more, which means you're talking of the term of two presidents. In the Pimentel et al, no time frame that I could read, not clear, but it will take a number of years to execute, easily a number of years, may even be more than a decade. If you're reading the Rivera Gonzalez, not clear, but it will also take a number of years to execute. The interesting thing is the US one, the PDP lava. The time frame is at least six and a half years. But by the way the institutional design was done for Article 10 of the local government, it can actually take forever. And the danger of this proposed constitution, because it starts trying to become detailed, its design is that we could actually get trapped in a state of nowhere, where it were neither unitary nor federal, but in a perpetual transition to nowhere. So that's the PDP now. Okay. Um, if it's already frowned upon in terms of power, it becomes more problematic here. In because under the Duterte administration, it's not just over, it's actually end. And end. We're on our own because no democratic country has been crazy enough to make these constitutional overhauls at the same time. Okay. So you're multiplying okay, the institutional boundary and configuration. Just when you think it could not get crazier, in the first sauna of the new president, he says, okay, you know, my advice to you is maintain a federal system, a parliament, but be sure to have a president, something that is copied from France. He wants a semi-presidential system. So, semi-presidentialism which before the theater was not there in the forms of government debate under Ramos okay, and Gloria Roy. But because the president wants it, okay, 
Okay, so I have to say first the dual executive of the semi-presidential. Semi-presidentialism is when you when you have a directly elected president okay, and a prime minister. If the president is not directly elected, even if you have a president in a parliamentary form, it is not semi-presidential. Just to give an idea how powerful the simple fact that you are elected. You may have actually limited constitutional powers, like the one that the PDP Laban is trying to recommend. But if your president is elected, especially in a country with the tradition of electing their president, that president is going to be powerful. Okay, so no democratic country has been created. Okay, the dual executive. The new president wants semi-presidentialism with a dual executive. And like a jukebox, we have a semi-presidential constitution. The PDP Laban, as a president, and as a prime minister, and a it is semi presidential. Dual executive okay, is up and with its very tricky executive veto gates. Let's do the intellectually complex. In terms of intellectually complex, actually the institution of design literature is very exciting, okay, especially if you're a young scholar reading it, especially in the heydays of the early 90s. But institutional design literature, as of now, has actually sobered from the enthusiasm of the early 1990s of the power to get institutional design right. Uh, one article, for example, in 2013, which actually uh, assessed the state of the literature, including the experiences of political scientists who actually advise new democracies of their, of, in terms of changing, not their electorals, uh, not their systems of government or forms of government, but just one aspect of the institutional configuration, which is the electoral system. Okay? It is a more sobering assessment okay, of both the power and the limits of institutional design, especially for new democracies, wherein a number of the predictions of the model did not come to and they were actually even frustrated because once they advised politicians, advised cherry pick the recommendations for the for the, what the politicians like, okay. which would mean okay uh, the same thing, which could mean the same thing for us. Um, same with, with Fukuyama, the title itself, limits of institution. This is true even for the institutional design literature and federalism. And one favorite of mine, Rollins' work on federalism, actually assesses the many of the reforms of the new federalism, or even the old federalism, okay, actually did not uh, uh, go as planned, okay, and actually become problematic. Uh, the institutional design literature, therefore, the Philippines Constitutional Overall Project in 2016-2017, for me, is the height of intellectual irony. Because the literature has sobered, but in this country, okay, we have become gung ho and wanting to change everything. So, is it the, okay, is it you, please? Or, and or, ignorance of the literature. Um, uh, let me tell you a secret uh, that shocks my students who hear it. I see it, I say this in my federalism class. Okay, so if you promise not to tell the secret, uh, I will also okay, tell you. After an extensive review of the literature of Filipino writings, lectures, videos, etc. on federalism, the Philippines does not have a single expert on federalism. If there's one, I have yet to encounter him. Very important qualification, I am also not an expert on federalism. But we don't have one. And it's not a problem with me because I'm not advocating the vision. What the country has are people who write and talk about federalism. You remember this. 
expertise is different from people who write in feminism. Um, the quality of their output does not inspire confidence that they know what they are talking about. Not only is this frightening, because they are recommending that we again rebuild the ship at sea, it is also sad because this country has a number of experts on decentralization. We have good intellectual capital okay, on decentralization. Why is this important? Because if you're going to talk about reforms, decentralization would be an important aspect. And we will not be able to tackle it. Okay? Another qualification is that I'm also not one of them, okay? which is sad. So, lofty goals. The goals have to be lofty because you have to sell your product. If they're not lofty, why change the constitution? But if they're lofty, are they believable? And the institution of design literature is very skeptical of lofty goals. Um, we start with Dr. Osebo Abueva, former president of the university a member of the department, and also a member of the College of Public Administration. Um, yes, an article, Some Advantage of Federalism and Parliament, of Federalism and Parliamentary Government for the Philippines. This is 2005. Okay? And during the time of Gloria Royo, the acknowledged expert on federalism is Jose Mueva. He lists a number of advantages of the proposed federal republic in terms of federalism. I just mentioned three because it would take forever. So the Federal Republic will empower our citizens by enabling them to raise their standard of living and enhance their political awareness through their participation and efficacy in elections and the, and the making and carrying out of government decisions at the regional and local levels. That's, the, that's number three. Number four, the Federal Republic will improve governance by challenging and energizing state and local leaders, entrepreneurs, and citizens around the country to take hold of their destiny. Federalism will release them from the costly, time-consuming, stifling, and demoralizing effects of excessive central government controls and regulation in our traditional unitary system. The Federal Republic Fifth will thus stimulate and hasten the country's political economic, social, and cultural development. This is not institutional analysis. This is a magical incantation of institutions. Okay. Important qualification, though. Dr. Aguerba, since 2016, no longer supports federalism. Okay. He is for just decentralization. Okay. Uh, an Australian political science, an Australian scholar, in the Department of Political and Social Change, got to review the literature on federalism up to 2006 or 2007. Okay, and this is Ronald May, and it's an important chapter in the book Federalism in Asia, whose one editor is Brian Galligan, whom you already met. After assessing the literature up to glory Aroy, what was his conclusion? Okay. The advantage claim for federal over unitary systems they read more like statements of faith rather than recent arguments. Statements of faith rather than recent arguments. Okay. The review of literature of an acknowledged a federalism scholar in Australia. That was the state of the literature when he ended his review. After 10 years, has the state improved? Well, we could use one article of now the acknowledged okay, father of Philippine federalism, or the one advocating Philippine or federalism for the Philippines, no other than okay, the, also the father of decentralization under the 87 Constitution, and then it didn't tell. Let us concentrate on this paragraph. 
Um, I'll read. For the proponents are aware that federalization is not a panacea, a cure all. What is simply suggested is that properly refined, the federal system will actually expand to the fullest extent possible the people's power and authority to chart their uh, to chart the course of their own destiny. Okay? Uh, federal proponents seem to like the word destiny. Short of granting them full independence in their respective federal states. Um, this expand to the fullest possible uh, the people's power and authority to chart their own destiny. And then the properly defined, I would like to discuss. Uh, when you see the term properly defined in institutional design or uh, someone advocating institutional reform, this term is a red flag in institutional design. Why? Because of the complexity involved in institutional design. No such thing in institutional design at the level of system of government. You could never get the design right. Why? It's actually hoping that you have 10 marbles okay, and you have 11 holes. You throw it in the air, all fall in those 11 holes. Not just 10, but 11. It is impossible. And this chart, uh, the course of their own destiny, meaning improve the democratization, is actually challenged by work skeptical that federalism re results in better democracy. You have met Daniel Treisman, who says that after if you re review the literature, it shows that there's no marked improvement okay, between federalism and democracy and unitary democracy. Uh, one work, I mean, another work by scholars that you've already met, and a plain person, does federalism impact on democracy? Minimal. Minimal the same as unitary. Then you have a stronger article by uh, Joe Fawerracher, as well as Pat Landman, Constitutional Design and Democratic Performance. Here, on certain indicators, unitary systems do better on democratic performance. In terms of lofty goals still, okay, according to G two German political scientists, okay, uh, Prasant and Merkel, First one is Aurel Croson, teaching in Heidelberg. The other is Wolfgang Merkel, who actually went here in the country. Uh, according to them, in this article, Political Party Formation in Presidential Parliamentary Systems, okay, uh, these lofty goals exhibit hyper-rationality. What is hyper-rationality? It is the belief. Okay, it is the mistaken belief that just because we change the rules, politicians' behaviors will also change. I, in, I call it in my classes uh, hyper-institutionalism, this belief of hyper-rationality, which is, for me, the exaggerated belief in institutional design. Institutional design is powerful, but in order for you, for it to make for you, I mean to make it work for you, is that you should know its limit. Otherwise, it can be very dangerous okay, because you're fooling yourself. Karin okay. Tagepera, uh, you already met, is an expert on electoral system. Okay. This is the work. According to him, excessive optimism in institutional design easily leads to excessive disillusionment afterwards. And this is now my argument. Undermining rather than deepening democracy. Okay, so you might actually okay, get on everything in terms of institutional design. Like at times some proponents of federalism say. And get so disappointed with the outcome that you don't believe in democracy anymore. An authoritarian okay, populist leader come in and say, look, you, we have already tried different types or systems of democracy, let us do an authoritarian one. Okay. And it is unsafe, highly risky, we'll discuss in cautionary insight. Okay. We now focus on the reform. Okay. 
types of reform. Let's make it, let's make the verb a okay. noun and make it plural reforms. By reforms, do not need constitutional revisions. They only involve legislation, or if we need to make constitutional, uh, we need to touch on the constitution, these are just constitutional amendments. Um, why is it preferred more justifiable? And here we value two reform principles from Gary Diamond. Developing democracy. Uh, first, reform only in the face of manifest laws. What does manifest mean? Manifest is, it's, all, it's already clear to a number of people, to a number of groups. Meaning there's already a constituency backing the reforms. B, reform should correct those flaws, those flaws as specifically as possible. The last thing that you want is to over-reform. Second, yes, this thing, messed up reforms are more reformable. If there are errors in the reform, then it is easier to return to the old setup. Or to push it further to the new setup through new legislation and or amendment. This is okay, business, piecemeal reforms that move to a more parliamentary like direction. For example, party system reforms against third vote system. Or a more federal like direction, which is increased regional autonomy for a more robust local government, which would only involve legislation in this country. In fact, this party system reforms for a number of institutional design scholars may yet be the most crucial prerequisite before any talk to a con constitutional shift to a parliamentary system or a semi-presidential one. According to Sartori, Giovanni Sartori, a major Italian political scientist, or let me qualify, let me correct that, a major political scientist was Italian, Giovanni Sartori, uh, in, a, in his work, neither presidentialism nor parliamentarism, Sartori warns us that undisciplined political parties in a presidential democracy becoming disciplined in a parliamentary ship is against all of us. Okay, Mind Warring and Sugar, in this work that I mentioned earlier, says that undisciplined political parties in a parliamentary ship are actually more dangerous than presidential ones because they could exacerbate problems of governability and instability. If in presidential system, it only affects legislation. In a problematic parliamentary democracy with unruly parties, it's government formation and dissolution. Croissant and Merkel, we have already encountered them. This work talks about different time horizons. Very important if you're doing constitutional overloads and why scholars run at that. The consolidation of the new party system would actually take much longer than changing the constitution. Theoretically, you could change the constitution in one week or in one month. Okay? But to consolidate that party system, can take years, can even take decades, such that okay, before the Constitution is consolidated, okay, the old practices have actually taken over in the interpretation of those things. Okay, so old fragmented, clientelistic, and irresponsible parties would not be able to create strong and stable okay? And the overholder systems are forms of government, very different from messed up constitutional revisions involving system or form of government, especially for shift to federalism. Because as we have discussed, we have the, the principle of one, the principle of constitutional intention, protecting its status. No federal country negotiated under democratic conditions has ever returned to unitary. 
once federal, under democratic conditions, you remain federal. The only ones that have become unitary are what, what one pro-federal scholar, Nancy Bermeyer, calls us, okay, in, in her article, Import of Institutions, as forced together federalism. So in the context, forced together either by war or a colonial power. Under a democratic constitution, you're federal, that's it. Uh, okay, for those who are still here, let's have number three. That's, this is the last that I will discuss in any depth. And as I promised, the last, the next three, very short. Third cautionary insight, hey, this is our stuff. Institutional design is political design. The politics in the institutional design. According to Adam Sworsky, in his monumental work, uh, Sustainable Democracy, together with okay, 19 other top scholars, there are no optimal democratic institutions. So let's imagine B as your possible optimal democratic institution. According to Adam Sworsky et al, in the word sustainable democracy, no such thing. But, okay, and even if there were, assuming for purposes of debate, there are, there's such a thing, and an optical democratic institutions or optimal democratic institutions, so let's take this out, okay, the distributive impact of institutional design means opposing political oppo uh, forces will most likely not choose them. When you say distributed, it means okay, who gets what? Who benefits? Who gets the pie? Who gets the lion's share? And of course, also, who are left out? Distributed impact. So, A is where you are, B is where you want to go. If we could diagram this, when you talk of institutional design as political design, you'll never get it right. It's always someone else. Because there are, institutional design is not a scholarly thing. Politicians are the ones who do this. We want, it could be we do, okay, or even we three. And okay, the swings would be uh, cost, by opposing political forces. Okay? The most important actors are those who will write the constitution. Okay? B1, B2, each institutional design outcome reflects the balance of power. And together, all of them would be the political economy of institutional design or constitutional engineering okay, that we talked about. Okay, so let's now discuss the political economy of the federalism project in the Philippines under Duterte. The federalism project in the Philippines under Duterte is different from the federalism project before Duterte, 1986 to early 2016. Uh, the only president to support federalism was actually a royal in our campaign platform in 2004. Uh, but Hap Hassel's support, okay, when she became president, uh, she would come up with a consultative commission, and that consultative commission will produce a proposed revision of the 1987 constitution in December 2005. In fact, the head is Dr. Abueva but it will relegate federalism to only two transitory provisions, Section 15 and Section 16. So, in this context, it only takes second fiddle or priority to the parliamentary project either of Ramos or of Aroy. Um Federalism project, very strong support of the president, prominent in his campaign platform. Like for example, in 
uh, March, on March 7, 2016, you have this article, Duterte advocating federalism. And a clear primacy over the parliamentary semi-presidential semi-presidency project. In fact, Duterte, in my review, does not talk about parliamentary and semi-presidential until he wins the presidency. I could not find any talk of Duterte promoting parliamentary and especially semi-presidency. It was after the victory and semi-presidentialism come to the top. So, move. We have U, you have F, ESP's presidential or semi-presidential. The problem is, how do we reach here? But remember, whenever a scholar talks about shifting to federalism, remember that he's not the one going to do it. He's just advising or writing. That's an important point to remember. Because in the final analysis, someone else will do it. So you have The current preferred mode, and this was actually a surprise, because when Duterte was campaigning, okay, he was campaigning for a cons okay, constitutional convention. But when he won, the preferred mode suddenly of the Philippine president, the House Speaker, and the Senate president is what? A constituent assembly. Okay, a constituent assembly. Okay? And the House Committee on Constitutional Amendment okay, has already passed a Resolution calling for CONAS. This constitu Constituent Assembly could be found in Article 17 of Amendments or Revisions, and it's found in Number 1, Section 1, wherein, okay, although not mentioned in the Constitution, okay, that's the Constituent Assembly. There is a problem, however, because it is silent on whether Congress will vote separately or jointly. For something as important as how to amend the Constitution, and note, and note three fourths, that's a, a very strong supermajority. That's why we have never changed our Constitution. That's why the pressure has built up. Because for 30 years now, not a single constitutional amendment has succeeded. Which is, which you, if you ask me, is not really good institutional design because the pressure is built up. Um, notice, it's silent on are they going to vote separately or jointly. Uh, let me tell you the story on this, okay, about the Congress, okay, not being, not its, or the Constitution not being clear whether it's separate or jointly. It has something to do with the sequence of the approved articles in the 1986 Constitutional Commission. On July 9, 1986, the Committee on Constitutional Amendment already finished the article. And they assumed that it's going to be, the Congress will be, what? Unicameral. Because the consensus among the framers is unicameral. On July 9, 1986. But to their surprise, on July 21, 1986, by a margin of one vote, 23 versus 22, okay, two were absent. The bicameral vote won over the UK Okay, by a margin of one vote. And the problem was, okay, the committee never got to revise substantively the uh, article that they have read in two. On October 10, 1986, the Committee on Style went through Article 17, but missed up on whether Congress is unilateral, I'm sorry, Congress would vote for, okay, with as one or seven. This is important later on. If the Duterte administration loses in the Senate vote, because of its control of the Supreme Court. But for now, for now, the agreement is separate. Okay, there's an agreement among, between the Senate President 
and the House Speaker that the vote will be done second. For now. So, it's context. Assuming that the Duterte administration could get the three fourths vote in the Senate, which is a big question mark. Okay. Um, look at the power of institutional design. It's 18 over 24 in order to get the vote. Meaning that in order to stop the Duterte project of federalism, how many senators do you need to vote against it? You need, you need only, not six, but seven, seven. There are six anti-federal senators that will never vote for the constitutional change, no matter what happens. Which means okay, that it could be as dramatic that it will go down to one vote. Because the institutional design is three-fourths of all members, one senator would hold hostage a country of 105 million votes. Why? We framed our institutional design this way. Okay. If you ask me, they don't have the numbers. If you ask me, on the other hand, if it goes out of the Senate, okay, it will win the constitutional design. Let's do the lower house. 223. You need 223 votes up to 297 in the lower house. And because of your lower house, no question, it's a penalty. It should work. Okay. We could even make it three fourths. Because no question, it should work. Okay. Uh, let's now discuss the Philippine Congress. Okay. Let's make just two uh, comments. Uh, discuss the House of Representatives only because it's the far more interesting house to discuss. Uh, one, very low level of institutionalization of political parties. And one of the most crucial indicators, uh, you must have discussed this in your all-side classes in other universities, what would be the, one of the most crucial indicators is the one that you see in our country, party switching. Okay? If you abandon your party, okay, when uh, it loses, like what happened to Noi Noi, you know, I'll show you the numbers. Okay. That's one of the worst indication of party institu institutionalization. Let's do this. The 17th Congress, the one that will become the CONAS. Election result for HOR, House of Representatives. PDP Laban had only three out of the 297 representatives. Only three okay, were fellow party members of Duterte when he won in 2016. Noy Noy's party had 116. But after the realignment, post-election party switching and realignment, PDP Laban, Laban membership and allies well to a supermajority of 216. Uh, party discipline, if it's too strict, is not a good thing. But this kind of party discipline is something else. So, supermajority, a very low level of institutionalization. Okay. The official minority, which is interesting in the 17th Congress, okay, because they, at times they're more majority than the majority, okay, is only composed of 20 plus. And the minority, which is not even the official minority, if you're following congressional politics, is down to seven. Uh, what would be the implication of low level of institutionalization of political parties? It's well known in the literature. Okay, the president has to pay more in terms of higher level of payoff to move the legislative agenda of the executive. You, have to need, you need to have more pork barrel, pork barrel by any other name, CDF, EDA, DA, or Duterte Sport, no name yet. More incoherent uh, lawmaking as more policy side payments are made with more players representing particularistic interests. Higher level of payoffs is the actual pork barrel. Side, policy side payments will be concessions that you give in terms of watering down legislation. And then the third would be more unstable political support once the president is no longer popular. But that, they started very popular, now just popular, 
Okay? In Philippine politics, you'll never know. Six months is an eternity. How popular would it still be at the middle of this term? Okay? Um, you would want that to be more stable political support for the incumbent president. Second is high level of bar high level of barrier to entry. It is the second one. And the most one of the most crucial indicators is always mentioned. This would be political dynasty. Uh, I'm not aware of any scholarly work on the 16th Congress, okay, uh, 2013, 2016, and the current 17th Congress. But I'm aware of at least two on the House of Representatives of the 15th Congress uh, by Mendoza et al. in 2012. This would be their work published in the Philippine Political Science Journal, Inequality and Democracy, Insights from an Empirical Analysis of Political Dynasties in the 15th Philippine Congress. Um, Dr. Mendoza is an economist together with the others but he teaches in the Ateneo School of Government. So I think I could still include him as one of my political scientists. In his work, 70% of members of the 15th Congress are members of a political dynasty. This is the one always cited. 70% of Congress, members of political dynasty. That's his work. By political dynasty, he defines it as, okay, with kinship ties to at least one legislator in the 12th, 13th, 14th, or 15th Congress, or at least one local government official elected in 2010, I'm sorry, 21, 2004, 2007, or 2010. This is their dynasty three okay. Then I have okay, another word by one of our colleagues in the department. Dr. Temari Rivera. Uh, okay, so all side majors here in the department. I am, might have been under him. He still lectures in the department. And he has this work in search of credible elections and parties, the Philippine paradox. Uh, according to this work, 34 out of 77 provinces, or almost half, 44% had the same political family winning the governorship of at least one congressional district. If the Mendoza work talked about the extensiveness of political dynasty, this one is the intensity of political dynasties because it talks of control in one province. So uh, if you come from the provinces, you might actually want they check your provinces. This would be the okay, 34. Okay, so I've slowed down. Okay, you might want to check your provinces. Okay, so people can take photos. Okay, I could ask. Okay. Actually, some provinces even have senators in them, making it a three prong relation. Okay, and it's not the provinces that have mayors. For example, Shirley Ilocos Norte, okay, during that time, we have Marcos. Ilo Defensor, Udima. I think four or five. Uh, Aurora, Angara Castillo, okay, Senator Angara. I'm sure you could do a better job than I'm doing now. Okay. I think a number. I should ask Dr. Rivera, but I'm telling him his chart was a hit in my lecture. Well, we have a media kit, okay, uh, if you want, okay, we can listen to it. Good that people are checking their profits. Uh, don't tell me right, there are too many, uh, 34. Okay, so perhaps I could now move. Uh, what are the problems of political dynasty? The first one is that they tend to be self-perpetrating. Okay? Once in, they become okay, more numerous in that context. Like the work of Dr. Mendoza, okay, political dynasties become father and father. They become self-replicating 
and self-perpetuating because father begets son, son begets okay, also son. Okay, so they tend to reproduce. Okay, it's a lineage thing. Second, highly clientelistic. It's patronage based because familiar clan interests take precedence over any national interest. A choice between national interest and clan interest, the record is members of political dynasty choose their clan interests. Then third, of course, prevents party institutionalization okay, because dynasty, dynasties act as the surrogates of party systems in this country. Okay, and it becomes a double bond because as I said, okay, clan politics tend to replicate endlessly. Okay. So we now can do the political economy of federalism. Call us members who are winners of the old unitary presidential setup. These are your congressmen. They were just doing the lower house. According to the challenges of consolidation, okay, this is a work of the two scholars that have already met on uh, presidential parliamentary, not on federal, because I could not find one. According to them, your CONA, okay, uh, applying their insights, we could look at the CONA's members of the lower house, the 17th Congress. They are overwhelmingly for non-institutionalized and dynastic interests. If we're going to look at the group of representatives we have in the lower house, what are their two interests it's non-institutionalized and also part, um, clan based dynastic interest. Okay? According to Haggard and Kaufman, compromises with groups that have benefited from existing institutional arrangements in times of constitutional overhaul. So this would be compromises, would actually shift the idea if there's such a thing, institution to F1, or PSP1, if we're going to apply it in the Philippines, parliamentary or semi-presidential. With the kind of contest you have, you're going to have a big distributed shift. Each institutional design outcome reflects the balance of power. And what is the balance of power? Are they for the reform of political dynasty or um, institutionalized uh, parties? No. So one can actually expect that the distributive swing would be more dramatic, that it would be actually further than the idea. But because of the complexity of the features involved in a constitutional overhaul, think institutional bundle and configuration, it may be possible, the scholars would say, that is F3, very different from okay, what scholars actually would say ideal for the Philippines. And you end up with PSP3. Okay. And in this context, this is the warning of Haggard and Kaufman that in a really messed up constitutional overhaul, what you're going to have would be hybrid outcomes that leave lines of accountability unclear and combine the worst of both worlds. Um, this would be your FSP. Um, and one could think of them as institutional Frankenstein outcomes. To hope that you're going to have the best of both worlds okay, would be wishful thinking. Okay, it may be in between. But if you end up with this, that's the nightmare scenario. Now, we talk about institutional indigenous. Okay? If you would remember what we discussed, what ex in terms of what explains institutional choices when you write constitutions and performance data. Okay? Among the most important factors are your ex existing vested interests. And in the context of the Philippine Federalism, these are your CONAS members who are benefiting from the old 
unitary presidential setup. It's as simple as this. If they're going to shift to federalism, they're going to accept their pound of flesh. Okay? They're not going to willingly go to federalism. And this is their privilege. They're going to bring them with them in a new federal form. Okay? That's the point of political economy. Okay? These are not scholars doing things, or students, college students doing their term papers. Okay? Their most important concern is to remain in power. So that's why in the literature, there's a premium on democratic regime transitions. Why? Okay. Because the assumption is that you're making a transition, so therefore, there is some kind of shaking of this vested interest. There's some kind of displacement. So in that context, the displacement of the existing vested interest. But okay, in our context, there's none. The worst, this is the worst case scenario of constitution making for Adam Sborsky in his, demo, in his truly classic work, Democracy in the Market. For those going to graduate school and interested in democracy, I strongly recommend, recommend this classic work. Um, according to Adam Sborsky, when the relation of forces is known and uneven, the institutions are going to be custom made for a particular person, a particular party, or a particular alliance. Okay. If we follow Adam Sborsky's argument, the constitution that they're going to have is going to reflect the supermajority's concern. According to John Elster, in his other work, Ways of Constitution Making, Constitutions ought to be written by specially convened assemblies and not by, ban not by bodies that also serve as ordinary legislatures. Why? To reduce the scope of institutional interest. To reduce the scope that these people who are going to write the Constitution are, of course, going to think of their future. So that's all. We're almost done. Such that the political economy of the federalism project in the Duterte, uh, sorry, project under the Delta, okay, one could think of it okay, as looking at this, and, an, and the analogy is that the same in a driver with the brand new, with a brand new vehicle, okay, it was always crush your old vehicle, driving it to Manila. You think that because he has a brand new vehicle, he could actually drive me safely from Manila to Sagana. All I could say is good luck. Okay, so we have three other cautionary insights, but I promise not to discuss them in any detail so that uh, we could finish. Okay. I just want to mention this. Institutional design has misdesigned. Uh, remember this, guys. The road to hell is paved with the best of intention. Under the 87 Constitution, they tried to limit political dynasty by actually introducing term limits, okay? which we never had under the 35 Constitution, which was patterned after the American Constitution. Term limits for our local officials and okay, legislative officials. In case you don't know, the 35 did not have term limits. The, we followed the American. We only had term limits for the president. And in fact, the term limits for presidents was um, the term limits of president were only introduced after the four terms of Franklin Delano Roosevelt after the war. Before it was a gentleman's agreement, after two terms he don't run. FDR of the United States runs for four terms. After that, they introduced a constitutional amendment in terms of the term limits. Okay? The term limits were introduced under the 87 to limit political dynasty, introduce okay, democratized access. What happened? For most scholars, okay, the argument is it worsened political dynasty. Why? Because the institutional incentive is for the whole family to prepare to take over. So institutional design can be misdesigned, strategically miscalculated. Strategic miscalculation of factor. I just have a fast note. Uh, term limits are a bad idea in institutional design. With presidents, you do term limits usually two terms, because presidents, they concentrate power. But with legislative, 
not a good idea because he penalized good legislators and local officials like Jesse Robredo. One could think that if he did not, there were no time limits, he would still be there in Dhaka, alive. Okay. Um, these are endpoints designed. It's at the end of the process. We don't really like that. What you want is starting gate principle, like electoral system, who gets in. Once they're already in, it's problematic. You try to limit their tenure when they're in. Electoral system design is who gets in. That's far more powerful. Okay? And then, okay, the law of unintended consequences. Same thing, you thought that you're goody goody, that you're a do gooder, that's a term that's the one that way next. And it's, oh, 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 okay, what happened here? Okay. Institutional design as design less. Okay, I might have mis uh, given the wrong impression that you could have to control design in terms of balance of political forces. Not necessarily, and not, okay. Uh, in such a strong degree. When we say institutional design as design list, we have only discussed one to three in terms of the upstream quality of constitutional uh, writing. Upstream is actually the act of writing the constitution. Think of it as a river. Upstream is when you write the constitution. But it does not end there because I don't think you have met a constitution that interpreted itself. There has to be other institutions that would interpret. Okay, Supreme Court, Congress, that would enable all these provisions, and the President himself, in terms of executive order. So that downstream quality, especially in the first years of the Constitution, would be as important as the design. And which, of course, would point us to the importance of the current okay, powers okay, or officials that we have. Okay, and postscript is the last, okay, I promise the last postscript. This is not actually coming from institutional design. This is coming from a democratization argument, okay, which I, I actually teach a democratization course okay, in UP, and I could see some of my former students here. I, I uh, shameless plug, okay, inquire article of Duterte in Institution of Design. I have, okay, actually, the last paragraph, okay. you know, federalism, okay, as I already mentioned, if it goes out of the Senate, my hunch is that okay, it's probably going to be approved in a plebiscite because of the strong resources of the president, okay, or the administration. Okay? But the irony that we're faced is that okay, the most serious attempt at institutional okay, overhaul this country ever faced is going to happen okay, with a president okay, with the most vehement contempt for democratic institutions. Okay? Um, democratic consolidation is about consolidating rules, especially in the context of an authoritarian challenge. Okay? In democratization literature, the ones that will protect you from an authoritarian challenge, especially okay, from the president himself, are the checks and balances enshrined in the democratic constitution. Okay? If you are going to change that constitution in the face of the very challenge of institutional design, the analogy that I always use in class, is like okay, you are dissatisfied with the current democracy. Yes, we all agree it is not perfect. The roof leaks. Okay, it is not well painted. Okay, but you want to change the roof at a time of okay, a great storm, and that storm is an authoritarian challenge. And you think that okay, that roof will blow away your roof, okay, and return it and return that old roof. Okay, as a new, brand new group. That, these are the odds that they're faced with the constitutional overhaul under an authoritarian challenge. And I think I'm done. Okay, we're done. Thank you.